I'm Peggy Dallinger. I'm the exhibit director. It's July 19th. 2019, and we're here to walk through the exhibit on Prohibition in New Jersey, Wet as the Atlantic Ocean. And we're here because we're about to take down Wet as the Atlantic Ocean, Prohibition in New Jersey, to make room for the new exhibit that opens in a week's time. We wanted to put the story of Prohibition in New Jersey on video for you so that if you didn't get a chance to come into the museum, which is located in front of the Ocean Township, Library at 703 Deal Road in Ocean Township, New Jersey, um, you'll at least get a chance to hear some of the highlights of the exhibit. So we're going to start with uh, this part of the exhibit, which is all kind of nestled quite comfortably on top of Woodrow Wilson's desk. It's unusual for our small town museum to have a national treasure, but in this case, we do. The desk before us, it belonged to Woodrow Wilson. He used it during his re-election re campaign, uh, which was headquartered in Asbury Park, and it's on loan to us from the Museum of the Church of the President residents in Long Branch, and we're very delighted to have it. Uh, it's kind of fitting that we're using Wilson's desk to tell this little bit of the story, because this little bit of the story delves into what were the effects of prohibition on the politics of the day. Prohibition took place as a result of the ratification of the 18th Amendment in 19. 19. Uh, it took effect a year later in January of 1920. And leading up in the years leading up to the ratification in 1919 and throughout the 13 years that prohibition was in effect, it was a dominant issue in political debate. We had the wets, those who were against prohibition, the anti-prohibition forces, hence wet, who uh, argued against it. And we had the dries, those who were in favor of prohibition and arguing vehemently for it. It turns out that New Jersey was kind of ideally situated to be in the wet camp. And for most of the history, it was uh, very strongly anti-prohibition. Uh, we had a large immigrant population, and we had many urban centers, and we were situated between Philadelphia and uh, New York City. And all of those uh, places were eager markets for alcohol and were loath to think that it would be taken away from them. At the time that prohibition was enacted, maybe half of New Jersey was in favor of it. Uh, but over the 13 years that it was in effect, for reasons we'll talk about shortly, it became less and less and less popular. Uh, we were also kind of uniquely situated on the Atlantic coast, where uh, the, the alcohol that was legal in the Caribbean and in Canada could be smuggled in. And so we had access to alcohol. We had ready markets for alcohol. And we had a political environment where our leaders were anti-prohibition and more than willing to turn their eye the other, in the other direction and allow uh, liquor to fr flow freely in the state for um, all of the 13 years prohibition was in effect. The title of our exhibit is Wet as the Atlantic Ocean. That's a phrase that came to us from the man who was running for governor in 1919, uh, the year that the states were busy uh, ratifying the, the 18th Amendment. And his, his vow was, if you elect me governor, I promise you that New Jersey will stay as wet as the Atlantic Ocean, a phrase he had used in reference to himself, saying, I'm from Jersey City in Hudson County, and I'm as wet as the Atlantic Ocean. So during the 13 years of prohibition, New Jersey had four governors. Three of those four were all anti-prohibition and, and basically were very lax in any kind of enforcement uh, for, of the law. Um, also, it dominated the national discussion. We had uh, five presidents during the 13 years of prohibition, and uh, each one of them had an interesting relationship to the law. Wilson vetoed the Volstead Act, which was the legislation that took the 18th Amendment and really detailed how it would be enacted. That's an important point, because all that the 18th Amendment does is, out, is outlaw the manufacture, transportation, 
and sale of alcohol. It doesn't even define what it means by alcohol. So the Volstead Act kind of put the details on what it was going to mean to enforce prohibition. And it, to the surprise of many in the nation, it decided that 0.5 was the uh, level of alcohol content that would be sufficient to be considered a banned substance, which surprised a lot of people who thought that their beer and their wine might be available to them even under prohibition. So that was just one of the problems with the law. It was draconian, and it was uh, it was a surprise and a disappointment to many of the people who thought that they supported it, but over a course of time decided they didn't support it. So uh, let's move on to the next part of the exhibit. At the start of any exhibit, doing the research that goes into it before any of the artifacts ever appear, uh, I always uh, try to ask myself the questions as a kind of naive learner uh, that are fundamental to the subject at hand. And so the question that occurred to me first when uh, beginning to research prohibition was, how come? How come we had prohibition? What was it about the time uh, that made it such a hot issue in people's minds? What, why prohibition and why prohibition when we had it? And in discovering the answer to that question, a lot of it had to do with the drinking patterns of the United States. The United States, even going back to colonial times before we were the United States, had been a heavy drinking nation and colony. Uh, there, I, in the colonial day, uh, the hard cider was often safer than the water to drink, and it stayed uh, potable throughout the cold winter months. So uh, alcohol and, and hard cider were an integral part of the diet and the, and the habits of our colonial, colonial forefathers and mothers. Uh, even the pilgrims, whom we think of as Puritans, uh, would not be adverse to, to drinking in their day and age. So what happened was that by the 19th century, the per capita levels of alcohol had soared. There were, in the early, I think, 1830s, uh, roughly, an estimated seven gallons of alcohol per capita for every adult in the United States over 14 or 15 years old. And as a consequence, it's easy to understand that alcohol, uh, alcoholism became a, a genuine societal problem. Problem. And it led to the breakup of, of families, the abuse of wives, the neglect of children, the loss of lives, the loss of, of life. And it was so in, uh, endemic and so problematic that temperance organizations sprang up in the 18th century that at first just wanted to temper the use of alcohol, but by the end of the century were lobbying for the outlaw of alcohol. And uh, so that was kind of the buildup was the uh, excessive use and the abuse of alcohol in the 19th century that led to a groundswell of interest in outlawing alcohol in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. We have a World War I uniform in the exhibit because World War I, which the United States entered in 1917, the war was over in 1918, had an influence on the outcome of the Prohibition movement as well. Um, the, we were at war against Germany, and the German brewers of beer in this country uh, had created a thriving industry in the 19th century, and so the anti-German sentiment that was promoted during World War I translated into an anti-brewer, anti-beer sentiment in uh, the campaign to enact prohibition. Also, the war was so senseless, so bloody, and so devastating that and it changed the world order. It made the United States a global power. Many were many in this country were very uncomfortable with that and longed to go back to a simpler time and wanted to uh, react to that by 
outlawing alcohol, they thought that would be part of going back to the America that once was. Um, also, the people who had been in the war had seen such devastation and felt that it was such useless waste of treasure and of life that they were ready to ignore authorities and live for the day, which kind of set up the Roaring Twenties and the speakeasy phenomenon and the willingness to kind of ignore the law. The women's suffrage outfit is here because there's a tight link between the temperance movement and the suffrage movement between prohibition and suffrage. Many of the women who were fighting against alcohol found their voice in the political clout through that campaign and, and realized that they were voiceless in the political system and turned their energies and intelligence toward campaigning for suffrage. Uh, at the same time, many of the forces who had a vested interest in not enacting prohibition, let's say the uh, liquor industry specifically, were very afraid of women getting the vote because they were convinced that women voters would vote in prohibition. And so uh, they, they campaigned and put their money behind campaigns against prohibition. But the uh, pro forces prevailed. And as I said, prohibition was ratified in uh, early in 1990. We turn now to a darker and more painful chapter in the history of prohibition, particularly here locally. When we think of the Ku Klux Klan, we think mostly of uh, reconstruction in the post-Civil War era, and we think of its incarnation taking place in the South. It turns out there was a second coming of the Klan during the 1920s, and this time the Klan was attracting members nationwide, including here in New Jersey. So right here in Monmouth County, in the uh, at the site that we think of that is today the Monmouth Park Racetrack, was then called Elmwood Park, and it was owned by the Ku Klux Klan, and it was the headquarters of the head of the Klan here in New Jersey, and it was the site of many rallies and conferences. Also, Camp Evans down in Wall Township was owned during this period for a time by the Klan, and it was a resort, kind of a club med, club med for Klan members. Um, the Klan had its message appealed to the draws, and it said, you know, as, as prohibition was playing out, there were many problems, unanticipated consequences that were becoming tr troublesome and problematic to society, including the rise of organized crime, uh, deaths and, and uh, disabilities caused by drinking uh, alcohol that was poisonous, um, many people attending and uh, going to speaking so they were breaking the law, so good otherwise law-abiding uh, citizens were becoming lawbreakers. But the Klan was arguing, no, 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 there's nothing wrong with prohibition, it's the enforcement of prohibition that's the problem. Let us help. We will be enforcers. And of course, they were targeting the immigrant populations, the Catholics, the Jews, who used alcohol in their religious ceremonies and whose cultures uh, had alcohol as more of a norm than the white Protestants who made up many of the drives and who made up many of the Klan members. There were Asbury Park Press articles on the front page of Klan rallies in the Ocean Grove Auditorium attracting thousands of supporters. And the coverage in the press was very neutral, as if they were covering a women's club or a Kiwanis club meeting without any censure and certainly without any alarm. The Klan finally died out, not completely, but certainly lost its influence and its membership nationwide and here in New Jersey and here in Monmouth County because this anti-immigrant stance was not good for business and drove away many of the people who came to Asbury and Long Branch and the shore communities either to live or to vacation or even as day trippers. And the businessmen were savvy enough to know that being friendly to the Klan was being unfriendly to business interests and uh, they made that known in a way that, that uh, discouraged and, and finally drove away this presence in Monmouth. County.
When we talk about prohibition in New Jersey, we have to acknowledge that our position on the Atlantic coast made us uniquely inviting to smugglers who were taking their schooners and their ships and sailing off to Canada where alcohol was legal or the Caribbean where it was legal or even as far away as Europe, bringing it back and anchoring their ships at the international waterline, which was three miles out until it was changed during the 20s to much further out, uh, 12 miles out, I think. Uh, and then local uh, fishermen and boat owners would uh, soup up the motors on their smaller boats and shuttle back and forth out to what was called Rum Row, this row of ships that were out on the horizon waiting for their uh, shipments of alcohol to be offloaded onto these smaller boats called contact boats that could out uh, run the Coast Guard and make it back in. And of course, the local fishermen and boatsmen knew the ins and outs of the coastline much better than the Coast Guard did. And so they were really, the, the Coast Guard was no match. As a matter of fact, they were, they were characterized and, and ridiculed in the newspaper as Keystone Cops because of the inadequacy of their ability to monitor the smuggling that was going on during the Prohibition. So New Jersey had its own Rum Row. It ran from Montauk down to Cape May, and uh, it certainly attracted the interest of organized crime because there was very big money to be made. There were organized crime headquarters in Highlands and Atlantic Highlands. Drew an, enough uh, of this gangster criminal element that at times there were actually shootouts in broad daylight on the streets of Monmouth County. Uh, there's one in particular in Atlantic Highlands that was covered widely in the papers. Um, then when we talk about the Coast Guard, we need to realize in sympathy that the Coast Guard had really been formed just a few years earlier in 1915 with the merger of the, or the Revenue Service and the Life Saving Service into what was then called the, the Coast Guard. And uh, all of a sudden it had all of its regular duties of monitoring uh, smuggling and uh, saving lives from ships uh, and shipwrecks. And all of a sudden there was this thing called Prohibition, and they were charged with, with running down the rum runners and the contact boats, and they were well outmanned. And of course, the Coast Guard itself was made up of wets and dries, and so there were many um, men, of course, in the Coast Guard at that time who had no sympathy for Prohibition and weren't that interested in enforcing it. And uh, there is local lore that says that the Coast Guard station that was at Takanasi Beach in Long Branch here when when the uh, floorboards of the of the station were were open there was a stash of illicit alcohol that was there that the Coast Guard was was minding so uh, it Calvin Coolidge was one of those five presidents that we mentioned in the beginning who uh, whose term coincided with Prohibition. Calvin Coolidge himself personally did not support Prohibition in the sense that I believe as a Republican, he was perhaps more libertarian than would be comfortable having the federal government tell you that you could not drink alcohol. But he was a good law abiding man and as president he certainly did his best to enforce the law of the land. And one of the things that he did in 1924 was, was uh, ensure that there was an influx of new capital and cash to the Coast Guard so they could at least upgrade their boats, their ships, and add ships, and train their men. And uh, that was really the beginning of the modern Coast Guard as we know it. Remember a minute ago I was talking about those fundamental questions that come up and kind of drive the direction of the research when we're doing an exhibit and, and, and designing what will be in it? Well, one of those questions is, so we had prohibition which made alcohol consumption, or not consumption actually, made alcohol sale and manufacture and transport illegal. Did people stop drinking? And the question uh, is answered in a sort of complicated way 
because in the beginning there was a reduction in the amount of alcohol that was being consumed. But over the 13 years of prohibition, that number kept rising. And so by the end of the 13 years, in 1933, you had about the same percentage of people drinking about the same amount of alcohol as they had at the start of prohibition in 1920. Also, there were ways that people got the alcohol. I mean, where did it come from? If they kept drinking and, and the, the sale and the transport and the manufacture were out, outlawed, where did it come from? Well, we just learned that some of it came from smuggled alcohol through Rum Row, but that wasn't the only source. The Volstead Act, which we mentioned earlier, the legislation in Congress which detailed how the, how the 18th Amendment would be enforced and what it meant, allowed some exceptions to the manufacture of alcohol. So they made it legal to, to drink uh, wine or any kind of alcoholic beverage that was part of a religious ceremony or service. And so you had um, a lot more attendance at church and some uh, additions to the population of rabbis in the state as a result of that exemption. Another was alcoholic, medic medicinal alcohol used for uh, in medicines. In this age, alcohol uh, and even cocaine was was in some of the even over over the counter or prescription drugs available to people uh, to cure their ills, and uh, so for doctors could write prescriptions for medicinal alcohol, and there was a huge boon in the drugstore industry in the country as a result. I think it was Walgreens that went from several dozen stores or maybe fifty stores to over two hundred stores in the first ten years of prohibition. So we had religious ceremonies, we had medicinal alcohol. You could keep any alcohol that you had in your possession when prohibition took, a pl in, took effect in January of 1920. You didn't have to give it up. So of course those who were wealthy enough made tremendous stockpiles, including one of those other presidents who would, whose term coincided with prohibition, uh, Warren Harding, who took allegedly four 2,400 bottles of his personal cash into the White House and allegedly served uh, drinks to the cabinet members during meetings. And this, of course, are the, the leaders of the country who are charged with enforcing the law that they were sitting there breaking. Another uh, exemption was that you could you could make your own, you could distill your own wine and hard cider at home for your own personal consumption. So that was exempted from the law. And um, the final one was uh, industrial alcohol that was needed for purposes of patent thinners and, and all of those industrial uh, chemical compounds that, that uh, needed to keep going on. And the, the interesting and sad part of that part of the story is that uh, whatever process they used to make it industrial and non-potable uh, was reversed or at least attempted to be reversed by many of the moonlighters who were selling uh, illegal alcohol and m much of it was lethal. So countless numbers of people went blind or were, were uh, paralyzed by, and died from drinking this, this uh, really lethal brand of re industrial alcohol that had tried to be turned into something that could be could be uh, uh, consumed. Um, I just wanted to point out that there are stories in the Asbury Park Press that here in Monmouth County, moon, moonshiners, those who were making their own al alcohol illegally from corn or potatoes or whatever, uh, were operating here in Monmouth County. And there was, there was a story of being able to drive through the streets of Homedale and look out onto the pastures and see cows that were weaving from drunkenness because they were eating the mash that was the byproduct of the corn being distilled into alcohol here in Monmouth County. So the answer is no, people didn't stop drinking, and these were the sources of the alcohol they were consuming. We've talked about uh, where the alcohol that people were drinking during Prohibition came from. Uh, we're going to turn our attention now to the speakeasies. The speakeasies were the establishments that were selling this illegal um, 
alcohol to the people who were more than willing to come and uh, imbibe and, and enjoy life. It's interesting, a little footnote to note, I, there's this beautiful dress here in the exhibit, and it is in stark contrast to the female attire that was uh, popular up to the 1920s. The, if you can picture the hoop skirts, the, or the, maybe the Edwardian bustles, perhaps more accurately, the corsets, the high necks. Here we have a very revealing androgynous straight style uh, with a lot of bare limbs uh, showing. And uh, this is the kind of dress that the women would be wearing to the speakeasies. Not only was their, their, their dress kind of revolutionary, but the very fact that they're showing up at the bar is revolutionary. The saloons of the 19th century did not allow women in, or they didn't, the only kind of women they allowed in were the women of the night. Um, and so th this was the first time, really, that women were showing up in public places, drinking and smoking, uh, and uh, wearing their, their flapper, their gorgeous flapper outfits. So speaking were these uh, illegal establishments. Some of them were in places that were quasi-public in the sense that they might be the back room of a restaurant, a uh, place that the public was invited to, but you kind of needed to know and knock on the window and give the password and speak easy to get in. Many of the speakeasies were in people's basements. The, in the course of this exhibit, we had many visitors come in and tell us about speakeasies they knew of right here in Ocean Township and in Monmouth County. So we were able to identify and document that there were at least seven of the public nature kind of speakeasy here in Ocean Township, and that there were countless numbers of these like private bars that were set up in people's basements uh, where they would get their stocks from the moonshiners or from the rum runners uh, or the, the people who were selling the wares from the rum runners, and uh, they would would have their like almost a private club so you would belong to this club and you would be able to go to this house and and imbibe in in uh, in the privacy of the basement oh, one of my favorite things about this exhibit is that we were able to find through the bottle shop on Monmouth Road in Oakhurst and their generosity a cache of bottles that had been taken from a speakeasy from a speakeasy from a home that during the 20s had been a speakeasy easy. So the home was being sold and uh, the bottle shop went over and bought this store of, of bottles from the speakeasy that had remained there for the I don't know exactly what year this took place, but let's say 70 years uh, in the basement. So we have bottles here and uh, bottles on the mantle and bottles in other parts of the exhibit that actually came from an Ocean Township speakeasy. And even more fun, they still have inside them the alcohol that was there in the 1920s. So we had, uh, of course, the west side of Asbury Park was legendary uh, for its world-class jazz and the likes of Duke Ellington and uh, Josephine Baker and just the, the, the biggest names in music and jazz were there. It was on the west side. The west side was populated mostly by African Americans and eth other ethnic communities, but the uh, all all of the populations, the white population, the white population that was vacationing on the east side, on the boardwalk, near the boardwalk in those hotels, would all frequent the hotel, the, I'm sorry, the speakeasies on the west side because that's where the really uh, happening hot music was. Uh, and here in, in Ocean, we had Ross Fenton Farms on Deal Lake, a very famous, which operated for the first 50 years of the 20th century and certainly through Prohibition and was accessible from the lake as well as by by auto and, and a number of others that, that are just kind of fun and interesting to think of what, what that was like right here in our midst. We've just walked through the setup and the big picture of Prohibition and Prohibition here in New Jersey. The rest of the exhibit takes a look at six different characters who have a connection in one form or another to New Jersey and played what I thought at least was a fascinating role in our local story. And uh, I mentioned just a moment ago when we were talking about the speakeasies, Ross Fenton Farm. So the first character that we feature is Mabel Fenton. Mabel Fenton 
Clinton and Charlie Ross were part of a vaudeville team that was that, that was popular, more than popular, I believe, as I understand it, superstars in their day, who bought a farm uh, that had been a, a roadhouse or a restaurant in kind of place in 1899 on Deal Lake, and they operated it. Um, and, it continued operation until the late 40s, although they, they died long before that. But the reason that Mabel is in this is not just because she was the owner and operator of Ross Fenton Farms, but because in the research, I came across an article in the Asbury Park Press in 1919 on the front page describing a raid by federal agents uh, on Ross Fenton Farms and other local establishments then because of their Ill illegal sale of alcohol under the prohibition law. And I thought, how can this be? I do know that prohibition didn't go into effect until January of 1920, and this is 1919. So Mabel is here to tell us this interesting little footnote to the story of prohibition, which is that in the fall of 1919, the Congress enacted a wartime prohibition act, uh, insisting that we needed the grains that were being used for alcohol for the war effort. The irony of that is that the, will, that the law passed a, a week after the armistice, but it was under this Wartime Prohibition Act where the drives were just trying to get a head start on national prohibition that poor Mabel was hauled off to jail. The next two characters that we want to talk about are Edward Edwards. I mentioned him, perhaps not by name, when we opened up our little review of the exhibit as the governor who was running for the for the um, position in New Jersey in 1919 and who coined the phrase, what is the Atlantic Ocean? He was voted into office and he was good as his word. He kept New Jersey wet. And the way that he did that is this Volstead Act that we've been talking about did not do a very good job of providing for enforcement. And the Congress did an even worse job of providing money to pay for any kind of federal level enforcement. The, they assumed the federal government assumed that the states were just going to pick up the slack and take care of the enforcement. So if you get a state like New Jersey that's vowed to be wet, you're not going to get much at all in the way of enforcement. Uh, Edwards is a little is interesting too. I mentioned that he came from Hudson County, a native of Jersey City, and he was backed in his run for governor by the mayor of uh, Jersey City, Frank Haig, who became a legendary, uh, iconic political boss, not just in New Jersey, but I think he's legendary nationwide. And his backing of Edwards in this uh, run-up to Prohibition was his first real test of state power. Edwards' story is, is a bit sad. He ran for a U.S. senator, is still running on a, on a wet platform. He was elected, but when he ran for re-election, he was not backed by Haig, who backed another uh, dry candidate, I mean, I'm sorry, wet candidate and uh, then Edwards, lost, so he lost his bid for re-election and then he lost his wife, then he lost his fortune and then he was diagnosed with cancer and I think it was all too much for him and he took his life in um, January of 1931. Then we turn on to Bill McCoy. Bill McCoy was this handsome, charming, debonair uh, sailor and boat builder from Florida. So I've promised you that these people all have a connection to New Jersey. So here's the story of Bill McCoy. Bill McCoy is allegedly the person who invented Rum Roll Row, who came up with the idea of having uh, ships, privately owned ships, go to port of calls where liquor was legal and bringing it to the coast and anchoring offshore and having their uh, le their stores of, of liquor transported to the shore by these small contact boats and have this thriving industry of smuggled alcohol. These, these men were called rum runners and Bill McCoy is considered the first rum runner. It may or may not be true because the complicating factor is that Bill McCoy was extremely good looking and 
a bigger than life personality and the papers loved him. So there was a lot of news coverage of him. So I promised you a New, Jer New Jersey connection. Here, here it is. So in 1923, Bill McCoy was arrested or stopped by the Coast Guard um, off of Sandy Hook and pulled in and arrested. He lost his ship. He went to jail in Essex County, I believe. And he, this is a testimony to how charming this man was. He charmed the warden of the jail so that he could leave the prison every day as long as he was back at nine o'clock at night. And he was caught when he and the warden were together in a photograph at a major pri prize fight that was published in the, in the New York papers. And people said, hey, isn't that Bill McCoy? And isn't he supposed to be in jail? So he lived a long life. I think he gave up his rum running, went back to Florida, and took a, er, and took up a boat building again. I think, as, if I remember correctly, that's the story. And this bottle of Seagram's that you see in the Bill McCoy uh, setup here is one of those that came from the speakeasy here in Ocean Township, and it contains the alcohol from the day, from the 1920s. We're going to move on now to Colonel Ira Reeves. We've talked about how lax enforcement was in New Jersey. Colonel Reeves was hired and sent to New Jersey as the head of the New Jersey um, squad of federal prohibition enforcers. And he was in the job for eight months. After eight months, he said, I can't do it anymore. The man was so frustrated. He was upright, law-abiding, wanted to do the right thing, and was foiled at every turn. There was dissension in his own ranks. The court cases that he brought to judges in New Jersey were dismissed. The evidence was ordered to be returned. There was corruption in the police forces and in the, in the county detective's offices, and he just finally he said, this is the most thankless and uh, futile job that I could ever imagine. He quit after five months, and he joined the repeal movement. So I think that that was interested that this man, a, a, a war veteran of two different wars, had been done in by the prohibition as it was enforced, or lack of enforced, not enforced, in Monmouth County and in New Jersey. We move on to Kitty Dodd. Kitty Dodd was a sweet young thing who came with her husband from Ireland in the late 1800s. She became a widow. She had a number of children, four or five, I believe, and found herself needing to support these children. And as Prohibition rolled in, she remembered that her father back in Ireland had taught her how to make whiskey out of potatoes. And so she went into the business of distilling her own um, potato-based whiskey. It became so popular, I guess it was of such high quality, that she com convinced the women on her block to go into business with her. And she had an operation that involved uh, a whole uh, squad of, of, of women who had been trained by her. She got complaints on quality control, so she bought an old abandoned factory and moved it out of the house, houses into an industrial uh, facility where she could quality control the product. It was so well known and so popular that she caught the attention of the mob who bought from her. And uh, she attended uh, the convention during the 20s in Atlantic City, famous convention where the mob sat down and divided up uh, the, the territories for the illegal uh, import and, and sale of, of alcohol, which was a major, a major uh, moneymaker for them. I mean, this is the age of Al Capone. That takes us to the last character in our gallery of Prohibition characters, and this is Harry B. Crook, aptly named because even though he was the chief of detectives in Monmouth County, he was alleged to have a, a racket where he was um, asking for money from all of the speakeasies in order to uh, not uh, arrest and, and raid their establishments. Uh, he was uh, The picture of Steinbeck's here in, in Long Branch is on display because he was the house detective there. When um, Jonas Tooman found him, they became friends. Jonas Tooman was the county prosecutor, and I think that they were in it together. Neither man ever went to jail, but Harry Crook 
was censured and uh, written up as being unfit and incompetent in his job. And the final piece of the exhibit is, of course, the uh, story of the repeal. By the ni by 1930, really, the, the uh, 18th Amendment was repealed by the 21st Amendment in 1933. But by 1930, people were really tired of, of the chaos and the unintended consequences of prohibition. And by they were ready to, to make alcohol legal again. And of course, there was the crash of 29. And one of the things that was a consequence of prohibition was the loss of a major stream of revenue for the federal government on alcohol taxes. So when FDR ran against Hoover, two of the other presidents that we mentioned at the beginning of the five who were in office during Prohibition, uh, when, when FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, ran against Herbert Hoover, he promised that he would f fight for the repeal of Prohibition, and uh, he won. Of course, he was also uh, fighting and promising that he was going to do something about the Depression. And, and by making alcohol legal again, you immediately had an influx of revenue from the now taxable free, uh, legal alcohol, sales legal alcohol, and also he put many people back to work in the alcohol and liquor business, both the manufacturer, the transport, the bars, the, the restaurants, and, and all of that. So uh, he was, he was uh, soundly uh, endorsed and, and voted into office as a, a wet. Uh, it's just interesting to note that Hoover had run in uh, four years earlier against Al Smith, and uh, he ran as a dry. And so the prohibition, the issue of wet versus dry, was was top of mind through the politics of at least the 13 years, and and certainly, as we said before, well beyond. So uh, on December 5th of 1933, 36 states ratified in record time. This is the only constitutional amendment that is a repeal of another amendment. And uh, the, the 21st Amendment took place, uh, took effect, it became the alcohol became legal again, and what was called the noble experiment was over. You ready? So you look right at the camera, you can look at me, but you really want to look okay. at the lens. So that's how you look at the person who's watching the show. I am Pippa Lackey, and this is what I learned about Prohibition. Um, that Prohibition was in the 1920s, and, and people went into speakeasies to get alcohol, and, and okay, I got it. Okay, so you ready? Yep. Look up here. Hi, my name is Pippa Lackey, and I would like to tell you what I learned about Prohibition. Prohibition was when, um, when they, when people couldn't drink alcohol, and and it was in 1920, and these are the. People, these are the women that wear, this is the dresses that women wear to it. And... I have an idea. Okay, what's your idea? I need some ideas. Hi, my name is Peggy Dellinger and this is... Pippa Lackey. Right, and we're here to tell you what Pippa has learned about... Prohibition. So Pip, what is Prohibition? It was when people could not drink alcohol. And why not? What happened that made them not able to drink alcohol? Because it was not healthy. Well, we know it may not be healthy, but what did the government do? They made it... Poisonous. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But first they made it illegal, right? Yes. Right. And then when people were drinking it anyway, the industrial alcohol, they put poison in it, and then that made people sick and even killed some of them, right? Yeah. So when did this happen? What time? What years? 1920. Right, and it lasted 
till 1933. Uh -huh. Yeah. So let's see. Did people stop drinking? Nope. No. How did that work? Where did they go to drink? Speakeasy. Speakeasy. What's a speakeasy? It's where you would go and you would and you would go and you would get alcohol. Like this is why people thought it was called speakeasy because you have to speak quiet. Oh, that's what that, we think that's how it got its name. You'd knock on the door because it was illegal, right? Yeah. And they'd open the little peephole and you'd give them the password and you'd say it softly like speakeasy. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know if that's true, but yeah. that's the story, right? So what was it like in the speakeasy? What did the women wear? They wear dresses like this. Oh, very good. Anything else that you want to tell us? Where did the alcohol come from? Uh, um, sips. From where, hun? Sips. Sips? I'm <laughs> sipping it? Sips. Ships. Ships. I'm sorry. Okay, hun, thank you very much. You're welcome.